Well, good to see. All right. I thought the I thought the bluster of snow might have helped people off, but maybe maybe in Georgia that would have in Atlanta that would have stopped oh, everybody. Oh, we've been frozen in our homes clearly. Yeah, or stuck on our interstates. Uh, so if we've not met before, I'm Mark Saddam. I'm the uh, Executive Director of UNH Innovation, formerly the Office of Research Partnerships and Commercialization, if that sounds familiar to you. Um, so we're about two-thirds of the way through the series this uh, for the year. And so today's going to be a lot of fun. I've got to my left Keith McGregor, who is the Director of Venture Lab, which is, uh, by most definitions, the most successful university incubator in the country. So you have how many? A fat, you had uh, more than 100 startups uh, that are active at the moment. So, so order, orders of magnitude beyond where we are. Um, <laughs> Keith, <laughs> Keith, Keith uh, and I also were just last week in San Francisco and part of the uh, startup business development course that's taught by Autumn, the Association for University Technology Managers. He's uh, also part of the Lean Startup Movement and has a, uh, does a lot of the curricula for the NSF's i program and is part of the Curricular Review Committee, which is based primarily on the Lean Startup model uh, and the Business Model Canvas. And so I've asked Keith, to co he's coming to help us with our i our proposal, but I've asked him to come, since we had him here anyway, um, to talk today about who owns your startup. Um, and as you've seen, we've got Ezekiel up on the board, so it's a good start. I thought I thought I would begin with this, uh, you know, our, our friend um, Jules Winfield from Pulp Fiction, and the uh, the path of the righteous man is is beset on all sides by the inequities of the selfish and the tyranny of evil men. And I can't think of a better beginning quote than to uh, use that to talk about who owns your startup, or rather, as I like to call it, the inequity of equity. And so uh, if you'll indulge me, I'll do that. I would very much prefer not to stand up here and just rattle on and on and on and have you interrupt me along the way. Um, and I may interrupt myself along the way. And I would be very happy to go completely off of this text in any direction you want to go. So uh, just feel free to just shout it out. You know, and, and I see that I have an escape path if you get too rowdy. So uh, <laughs> life is good. No exit sign. No exit sign. Yeah. Okay. Well, it looks like it may work. Sounds like a startup. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll go that way. Um, so this is me. I run uh, I run Venture Lab at Georgia Tech, um, and I'm also a big part of the iCore program. Um, I am a I'm a geek, and I've been an entrepreneur for more than 30 years uh, and an investor for more than 20. I've started um, or been a part of six or some odd startups myself as co-founder or founder. A few of them were great, a few of them were horrible, and most of them were t just blah. But it led to some good gigs for me. I, um, I worked in robotics at Lockheed because of, um, because of a startup, an AI startup way back when. I wrote the first 3D program for Macintosh and the first color paint program for Macintosh in the early 80s. That led to a gig at Apple Computer, so I ran the graphics group at Apple Computer for three or four years. If you use QuickTime, came out of my group. Um, got tired of living in California, in Silicon Valley, if you can believe it. I moved back to Georgia, where I'm from, if you can't tell. And um, after some hemming and hawing, started a, an internet startup in the mid-90s, because that's what everybody was doing. But it caught fire. I sold it to Mark Cuban at Broadcast.com. And two weeks after we closed that, Yahoo bought Mark's company. And so I backflipped my way into a directorship of engineering at Yahoo. I did that for a little while and then got bored and dabbled. And George Tech called and said, I'm looking for a nerd. And so I went, well, OK, let's go. I've been in tech for eight years. Um, Venture Lab does pretty well. It's the number one early stage incubator in the world, the number one for engineering science in the world, and number two overall in the world. We've been doing it for, Venture Lab's been around for 11 years. 100 active startups, um, but, we have a, but we have this great feed of Georgia Tech, and Georgia Tech is just stupendously inventive. We see a new idea more than once a day. And so we have this great infall, and we try to suss out what to do with it. But I'm also a part of the i program for, for the NSF. And the i is a network of nodes across the nation, and we teach this lean startup methodology to scientists and, uh, and students that come in from all over the nation come to our, our spots and learn it. By the way, Lean Startup now is known as evidence-based entrepreneurship. That's the new, new buzzword. So gears change. Next month, something else. Could you say that again? Evidence-based entrepreneurship. It's proof that it's been academia for more than two years. Yeah, exactly right. <laughs> what else are we going to call it? 
I was asked to talk about this topic, and we certainly go bananas with this around our ranch. And, and I have had more fights about this than any one thing I can think of, um, other than, you know, maybe a fuss about product market. But who owns your startup? How many of you are entrepreneurs or have startups? Okay, have you had to wrestle with this question? Do you have co-founders? Was it, was it dramatic to have this conversation? Here's how bad this conversation is for us at Georgia Tech. One of the, my early screens when I'm dealing with a team is I ask the team, you know, I teach them how to do what I'm gonna talk about, and then I send them away and say, okay, go and have the conversation as if we're gonna form the company. Decide how you're gonna divide up the equity, and then we'll meet again once you've had something written down in paper where you all agree. 40% of the teams never return because they can't have this dialogue because it's so hard to have this particular dialogue. So this presentation today is a mixture of two and you'll know when I'm into the section because I'm, when I'm talking about the positive happy things, it's gonna be on a white background. And when I'm talking about the not so happy things, it's gonna be on the dark background. But let's start off on a positive foot. Equity's got a lot of definitions. I like the first one too, let's be fair and, uh, and equitable. But the one that we're hung up with in startup land is actually this middle one. How do you divide up the shares of a company somehow? And, but, the, but both of these other ones really do come into play as well. The value after the deduction of any liabilities. I'll come to that when we get to the dark side because it matters a lot. Have any of you sold a company before or had an exit? I'll describe how that works when you have investors along the way. It gets really interesting really fast. But we're in happy land. So here's you and here's your startup and there's somehow this nebulous thing that, that is 100% of something. I don't know what it is, but it's 100% of something and there's several of you. And the question becomes, well, how do you divvy the pie? How do you cut it up in some way that everybody thinks is very fair? And so the first order of business is, well, what does it mean to divide up into this system? What, what sort of the guiding principles that you would use? Well, the first one to keep in mind is that equity should be proportional to the risk that's being taken. So if you think about it from the people that you might have been involved with, or as you think about this just you know, in, a, in an academic way, not everybody's gonna be taking the same kind of risk. They're coming from different points of their lives, they have different goals, different responsibilities, and so they will want to, their assessment of the risk that they are taking will be different than your own assessment of the risk that they'll be taking. And that's what makes this conversation super hard because no one really wants to talk openly and honestly about that. But that is an important aspect of it. So one of the things to think about here is to think about that first definition about fairness. And it's not, it's not just fairness, but it's the perception that you are being fair that matters more than anything else. In fact, it matters so much that it matters more than having a big old chunk of the startup. Because if you can't get along, if somebody thinks you're cheating them somehow, it will lay dormant for a while, and then you will have the big founder fight, and then things are gonna get messy. But let's build on it further, because supposedly you create a company and you wanna be successful and you want to grow the company, and you're going to hire people to the company and you might want to let them in on the game too. So a second observation here is that people and companies are generally hired in in waves of hiring. It's not, you know, in the first year, it may be you and your, your co-founders, but coming into that second year, there will be those first employees, those key people. And you'll want to compensate them somehow, but you probably can't pay them what they're worth because you're probably still young. So you might want to defer some of that salary or compensate them with equity somehow. So founders and then first employees and then a second wave of hiring maybe in the second or third year. As the company grows, you go through these sort of waves. And each hiring wave generally is a little bit larger than the last hiring wave. And you know you're in it when you think about the kinds of people you're hiring. So the technique that we have is we want to allocate the shares of ownership in a company in this kind of per wave idea. And the, and the way to be fair about this is to suppose, I guess someone did some study, and I can't remember just who it was, but they looked at this, this sort of hiring phenomena 
from the time a company was founded until it was acquired. And they found that on average, it's about five of these wave states that go through of hiring before you get to a state where you're acquirable. So let's plan for that. And let's account for that in the equity, fairness um, thing. So here's a, a technique to think of. Let's suppose we're going to allocate shares of the company. And we want to do it in a way such that when we're all said and done, the founders have end up with about half after all the waves of hiring have occurred. And so a way to think of it is to say, okay, let's give the founders, say, 5,000 shares of a company, and then the next wave of hires, the first hires, all together, total, will get another 1,000. And the next wave, maybe you hire 20 people, and you divide 1,000 shares up that way. Somehow you just kind of break it down like this. And so the percentage of ownership gets spread out in a very nice way because the people who are coming in later are taking less risk because the company's more solid. It's more stable theoretically. You can hire them. And so they should get less. And so maybe there are 1,000 total at this point, but it might be divided over 1,000 people. Who knows how you're growing? But think of this as sort of like the platform for fairness. And how would that work? So let's suppose we start on day zero and you have two founders. And you say, you know what? I really can't decide how to do this. I, I don't, I'm not a big fan of 50-50. I kind of like 51-49 because you have to be able to decide. But let's just go with 50-50. So just split it down the middle. And so the two founders eat the same number of shares. Great. That's year one. Year zero. Let's come to year one. Suppose you're going to hire four new people. Well, under this principle, then you give each of them 250 shares. So here, the first wave, take 1,000 shares and divide them up. And remember, we had 5,000 shares the first time through, so it, the pie starts to look like this. There's still great control on the part of the founders. And you can imagine this going so on and so on. And this, this one technique seems to be a reasonable way of allocating shares. Your mileage may vary. But to do so with respect to the kind or the type of risk that someone's taking to join the company as it matures. And that's the way in which we advocate doing it at Georgia Tech. This is the way we avoid most of the fights. We don't avoid all the fights, but this way seems to work. So again, each one of the waves gets the same number of shares. And the, another thought here is that the founders maintain control throughout this process. And so it's only until you get to those very mature companies where the founders actually in this state go out of control. I'm coming to the dark side in a moment. Any questions about this part? Of it? Sure. You didn't mention anything about the resources, the effort, the work that the, that the people put in. Oh. I'm coming to that. Oh, and the dark oh. side. <laughs> I know, no, no, that's actually a light side. Remember, we're, we're going to the dark side, friends, and it's pretty dark. Um, but I want to hit, I'll, I'll address that one in just a second. Any other questions about this as a framework? Could you imagine doing this conversation? I mean, it, it, it kind of works. I mean, it's not, there's no great way to get into it, but it becomes very hard to say, you know, what something's worth. And this at least gives you at least a methodology to go back to. Sure. But this assumes a fairly planned hiring sequence, right? Or, well, you can decide when your wave arrives. It could be a year from now, it could be three months from now, it could be four years from now if you're doing a medical device thing and you're going through FDA approval. And, but it also, but it assumes something very important, which is where were the investors? This is what organic growth looks like, where you don't have investors. Were you, are you going to ask that? That was my question. I'm getting, well, the investor's on the dark side. Okay. <laughs> and I can say that because I was an investor, so, you know, I'll tell you that. But anyway, is anybody in here an investor? No? Anyone want to admit it? You are? Okay. Okay. I'll, we'll, we'll, then let's talk. Or let's, let's share some secrets in a second. Okay. The next slide is really important. You always vest the shares, even with the founders. Nobody gets everything on day one. We have had this happen at Georgia Tech, where we create a start, some, a startup is created, and everybody says, okay, it's 50 50, or generally it's 25 25 25 25, 
And then about two months later, one of the 25 percenters decides, I'm out of here. I'm doing nothing. Well, now we have a mess. Now we have a big divorce to go through. We've lived through that too. That's bad. So you always vest. Even if it's your founder, even if it's you, you should think of it as uh, abstract from you somehow, out. And so you want to you want to vest your shares over time. And the general principle is a year cliff for 25 percent and then two percent each month thereafter. I'll come back to this with respect to investors momentarily. Okay. I don't know what that means, so that's shares. So this means even though you own it, you don't you don't have it yet. It's apart from you. In other words, your co-founder gets the right to buy it from you and whatever you agree on. So the guy that drops out after two months, even if he's that, he's he make a price. He still have the same uh, investment. Yeah. Doesn't he? He won't have the same investment. No. He can't just wait a few years. And he could. Generally, generally lawyers get involved, in my experience, well before the, any any long amount of time transpires. Long, but my definition of long is three months. Everybody lawyers up. Okay. So to clarify, in a scenario where I have a co-founder, and let's say we're 50-50 and they leave after six months, the vesting generally would not have triggered yet. That's right. And so I would be so you would have it all. term documents I have would be have an option to buy another very you, you would have it you basically have the ability to buy that person out at some agreed pre agreed upon price. So it wouldn't happen that they simply wouldn't have anything at all. No, you would say here's a hundred dollars, see you later. Okay, instead of here's a million dollars, see you later. Okay. That's what I mean. You you buy them out for par value, book value. You make them go away. Is there doesn't that then imply a bunch of tax implications for the vesting schedule? Um, it depends on how the company is structured. If it's passing through directly to you, there's always a, there's, there's always a tax issue. I am not a tax attorney. <laughs> I will not comment on tax issues. Um, you should have one though. Okay, um, so this is what the vesting would look like. So think of it like this. For a year, it's all up in the air. Who knows what's going to happen. After a year, you get a quarter of it, and every month you kind of hang on after that, you get a little more, a little more, a little more. You kind of earn your way in. So it means that you want to allocate the shares to that person, but you don't distribute them to them. They don't have it. So you just set them aside. And they will get it if they stick it out. This kind of makes for an, an interesting way of binding together with your co-founders. And that's, that's what you want. You kind of want them to be there. You chose them as a co-founder for some reason, right? You kind of want them to stick around, I presume. But it, it may give you the ability to get rid of some of the ninnies that you could have gotten together with and they look great on day one, but they were terrible on day 30. And you could do that too. Okay, now I want to get back to your question that you asked me just a minute ago. And that was, here's a few thoughts. What if you need a salary? Well, you know, founders don't get paid anything. Founders get paid last. When I created the internet uh, company in the mid-90s, my co-founder and I started it, we just bankrolled it on our credit cards, and, and we ran the company for about four years before we exited to uh, Mark Cuban and to Broadcast.com. During that entire time, neither he nor I drew any salary. All of our expenses were covered. We paid everybody else, and we were making a lot of money. Uh, uh, a lot of money every year. Millions of dollars every year in revenue were coming in, but we paid ourselves zero dollars. In fact, I didn't receive a salary based on that business activity until I actually became part of Yahoo sometime later. So founders get paid later, but what if you need a salary? Well, a temptation is going to be that a startup should trade equity for salary as a supplement. Don't do it. Don't do it. You'll never get it back. Write them an IOU. It's a loan. Pay off the loan later. It's a liability that the company has. Don't give up your equity. Same thing down at the bottom. What if I'm bringing in equipment that I bought or I've got patents and all that stuff? Again, it's a liability. Mark. I've also heard from a tax attorney, of which I'm also not one, that uh, doing that trading away salary for equity inadvertently values the company. 
because you would they would benchmark what that person should make, uh -huh. and then you put a valuation indirectly on the company, yep. and that screws everybody. You're, you're reading ahead on my slide. <laughs> but yes, you're right. That's a bad thing. But you know, you asked me this one. Hey, hey, what if I'm the idea guy? I'm the I'm the brains behind this operation. Don't I don't I deserve more? Well, no. You don't deserve more. You don't. Because the idea is worthless. The execution matters. And the company will execute on the idea. You didn't execute on the idea. You formed a company to execute on the idea. You haven't done it yet. You haven't done anything yet. Anybody can be smart in a shower. We, tech is riddled with smart people. And we tell them the same thing. The idea is what enables you to create value for a customer. It is not what the customer buys. That's what that means. Oh, and this one. This one is usually the controversial one. Hey, what if I'm not full time? What if I've got a good gig at a university? Or I'm working on, I'm working on this other company, however I'm moonlighting on my own idea. Well, in my book, you're not taking the risk. Therefore, you don't get the equity that a founder gets. Founder steps straight off the cliff. Holy cow, you're on the road. So they would be a, high, a first, first year, first wave higher perhaps, but not founder shares. Again, that's just my opinion. Your mileage may vary. Okay, why, why all these things? Why so stringent? You want to ask something? I'll, I'll stop. Well, okay, <clears throat> you're not getting a salary. Are you getting distributions? Are you getting anything for a company at the end of the year? You mean, I mean, if they're making sales? Yeah, I mean, it, as in. Oh, I would pay off the oh. debt immediately. You know, if you if you had an IOU to somebody for salary and you can pay them, yeah, you should pay the debts that are that have been accrued, as you can pay them. But not with equity. And Mark, Mark was right, okay? The point is that when you're doing this stuff as you're early, you really don't know what those shares are worth. And you could be, and you probably are, underselling yourself when you do this distribution. And founders are so exuberant about creating their thing and making it go be in the world and getting other people to love it and them that they are willing to do this sort of transaction of giving away equity just to entice people to come and be with them. And that is the dumbest thing any founder could ever do. You can never get it back. Excuse me. You can get it back, but it costs you lawyers and time, and it's painful. So you don't know what it's worth. And Mark is also right, because if you happen to do this trade, then somebody down the road, when you might go entice an investor, will look at it and say, you know, nine months ago, when you were doing mostly the same thing you're currently doing, you traded a hundred shares of your company for a thousand dollars in debt. Therefore, I'm going to buy it at the same rate. I would negotiate that way if I were aware of it. And if I'm going to invest in your company, I'm actually going to be aware of all your debts and your promises too. So I'm, you can't hide that type of stuff. So I'm going to make that argument. I don't think you want to have that argument. So, so you don't know what a company is really worth. So why trade this thing that constitutes or represents the, the division of the company for, a, for the dollars that you don't know what's worth. Later on, you can. At the beginning, you don't know. What if the guy from Dropbox did it? What if these, uh, what was the one that just got bought? A WhatsApp, oh my god. Okay, um, any questions before I step on the dark side? I'm anxious to get the dark side. <laughs> okay, then I'll go right there. Let me talk about inequity. Because you will perhaps want to have investors, and investors come in several categories, but here are a few that came to mind. You know, the, the, easy, the easy targets, the rich uncles and aunts that you have, um, the guy you drink beer with, uh, some other rabble rousers that might be in your neighborhood. Um, they, they generally want to help you do whatever it is you do. And so you'd be tempted to have them as an investor because you need cash and they might have a little bit of spare cash and then you might want to do something. Um, angels occupy kind of an interesting, 
a place because they sort of want to help, but they sort of want to make money and they have different time scales and different return ideas than VCs might have. And then we come to our favorite people, the venture capitalists, and I'll talk about them certainly in a minute. But you have to know what your investors' goals are. That's what this is really all about. And they, in each of these categories has certain goals at play. If you don't know what your investors' goals are, you're going to have a bad time. But the kind of investor that you have determines the kind of stock that they get in the company, the kind of ownership that they have in your company. And so if you think about the original pool of stock as being kind of the common stuff, there's a class of investors, the venture capitalists and some sophisticated angels will request a different class of stock altogether, the preferred stock, and I will talk about that. And friends and family, that's generally common stock. I also generally, advise people to never take money from family because it is a horrible time when you take five thousand dollars from your aunt who loves you and then you have to go visit with her on Thanksgiving and you have lost, all probability lost her five thousand dollars. It's a bad day. So let's look at the investor from a stock point of view now. And you can help me out along this way. So we're back to our scenario, two, found, com, two founders, 2,500 shares, 5,000 shares go on. The first thing you have to answer is the magic thing, which is, what's it worth? It's worth what somebody pays you for it. It's not worth anything else, but what somebody will pay you for it. It's full on market dynamics. And there's this thing that they do that I have done which is you consider what it's worth at the moment and then you put your cash in and then it's worth some bigger pile. And that's this idea. The pre-money and then you toss some money into the pile and now you sum that up and it's post-money valuation. So pre-money valuation, post-money valuation. And this game can continue through all sorts of rounds of funding. So pre-money, post-money. Then it's pre-money and then post-money again. And it goes on and on. And each one of those investment changes usually results in a new class of stock being issued. And that class of stock is called a preferred stock. And a preferred stock is like ordinary stock, except it comes with some additional rights. It actually loses some rights that they get no negotiated back in, like voting. You have to negotiate for a preferred stock to actually be able to vote like common stock can vote. But the rights that come along matter deeply to the founders and they're often overlooked in the exuberance of the founders to attract the capital that they usually at that moment so desperately need. So the kinds of things that, that would be argued for or negotiated for would be a liquidation right. If I give you money and the company goes belly up, then I want back either the larger of my original investment or my current percentage of ownership. I want that back. That's usually non-negotiable. Sometimes I want to get a payment, a priority payment back. If the company's making money, then I want you to pay me back something. If you watch Shark Tank, you see Mr. Wonderful do this negotiation. That's what he's doing a lot. He's all about this. He's, he's, he's doing okay. He wants to be bought down. Voting. You have to negotiate for voting rights when you have preferred stock. You don't have them by default. You have to ask for them. And then the friend of angels and VCs everywhere is this one, participation, which means I'm going to get paid back on my investment and then my investment is going to get converted into common stock. And so they negotiate for participating preferred stock. How does it work? Let's look at an example. So here's our company and we're going to go and raise some capital. And let's suppose for the sake of this argument that the company, whatever this thing is, is worth two million dollars and then I'm going to throw a million bucks in. And so therefore, I'm here. Three million bucks is the valuation after we've done that transaction. So after the transaction, the ownership of the company looks like this. It's third, 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 and it seems okay except the investor has got preferred shares which drag along with it certain rights that, are, that matter. Any questions about that? 
at the moment. Okay. Let's suppose things are going pretty well and, you ha and you are, you're hitting your milestones and the business is growing. You need to raise more capital to grow faster, better. And you go out and you raise another round of investment. And this time, let's suppose that that original $3 million investment has turned into what someone would value at $8 million. And now I'm going to add another $4 million in to make it a $12 million investment. So the ownership now looks like this, except we have two classes of preferred stock. We've got the A round and we've got the B round. And it gets a little more interesting because usually when you have an investment from somebody, they also want you to set aside some percentage of the company's ownership as an option pool. Just so you can pay for the CEO somehow that they might want to bring in. So they usually ask for about 10% to be set aside in an option pool. So after the first round, the A round, the ownership really looks like this, a third, 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 but we're just going to call 10% of it just for future allocation at, at our voting discretion. If we never do it, we still get a third of it. But we're going to do that. And after the B round, the percentages get even more interesting. But what I want to call your attention to now, after the B round, is how much of this company do the founders own? The minority. The minority. So from A to B, they've lost ground. The rule of thumb is if you can get out of a round of investment and you've only sold a third of your equity at that moment, you've done fine. You, that's, that's a win from a founder point of view. The downside is the more rounds you go through, the worse it gets for you as a founder. It, you may be going great guns as a company and it may be worth a lot more, but your ownership is declining, your control is declining. You're already working for somebody the moment you take a check from them anyway, but here not only are you working for them, but you're kind of at their whim. And these two can get together and make life very, very hard for founders. And it happens all the time. But it gets worse. I told you it's the dark side. Let's suppose you've been running your company for a while and you owned all your shares and you went and you found an investor. Well, the investor is going to say, look, I want, I'm going to put money in your company, but I don't want you to go anywhere. You're going to stick around for a while, right? Right, good. Let's do this. The way they do it is they say, well, I don't care that you already own the shares. I want you to revest, reverse vest your shares, typically for three years. So even though you own them, you agree as part of the process of negotiation, as part of the common terms of negotiation, frankly, that you will willfully give up ownership of those shares just to get that cash into the company. Well, guess what? That gives them now the right to buy you out if they, if you, if they think you're bad. Not only if you are bad, but if they think you're bad at the agreed upon price. Now it gets complicated. Oh, and by the way, all this stuff is participating preferred, which means they get paid back on their original investment and then they get the ownership on top of it. And that's rough to learn when you're having a good day like somebody wanting to buy your company. And sometimes they negotiate a payback that's not just one times the investment, but a multiple of their investment. And in fact, usually, the earlier you take the money, the more risky the company is, the more negotiation they make for a 2x or a 3x payback before they do the conversion. Let's do the math and see how it goes. So what's it worth? Here's our, here's our company and you know we were dropping money into it before and I think I, I said that you know this one put in a million dollars and that made the company worth three million and this one put in four million and that made the company worth 12 million. That's great. And let's suppose it executes for a year and somebody knocks on the door and says, okay, you know what? I just want to buy you. And I'm going to buy you for $30 million. Just buy the company. Buy this structure for $30 million. Sounds great. How much, does, how much do the founders get? It is not 19% of $30 million, by the way. <laughs> Why? Well, it's that darn preferred round thing that comes up to creep in. 
So we take the last round in and we say, okay, the last round was $4 million in. We're going to pay that back first. Mr. Wonderful shows up. We're going to pay it back. And then we're going to let you own some of the stock. Great. I'm going to take away, so that means this, this investor gets back four million bucks and, he's, and then he owns 33% of what's left over. Okay? Great. What about that first investor? Well, the first investor invested when it was risky, so he asked for two times. So what I want as an A round investor is I want twice my payback and then I want to own my 19%. So I want to get two million bucks off the top and then 19%. So if you do the math, it is not a $30 million exit before you start dividing this pie up. It's actually 24 million bucks. And now the founders get 19% of 24 million, not 19% of 30 million. And it's still pretty fancy walking around change, but it's not 19% of 30 million. What would happen if this company, instead of selling for $30 million, sold for $20 million? Well, now we're getting somewhere. Because if we do the math the same way, except we start with 20 instead of 30, the founders now get about half of what they were going to get. Even though it looks like a better, I mean, it, 20 million sounds like a big deal, but if you work for four years and you get 20 million bucks back and you think you own more of it, this is kind of a shock in the system. So what I want to do now is tell you a true story. There was a group that got together, a group of friends, had an internet security play. Three friends. Divided the company equally. Third, third, third. And they had another friend who was an angel investor. And the angel investor, they needed some cash. The angel investor said, all right, I'm going to give you 100 grand. What does that buy me? Negotiation happens, but this valuation occurred. 14% means the company was worth about 700 and some odd change thousand dollars at the investment, at the Angel's investment. And the Angel's investment was very lightweight. It was just common stock, no big deal, not very sophisticated, just kind of like a rich uncle type of an investment. Here's 100 grand, let's all go make some money. And it actually started selling. And it was selling really well, it sold. It was starting to attract some pretty serious clients. Not only that, the C a CEO was hired, and the CEO went out and raised capital. The A round, the real round, was raised. And the CEO found a VC in the Boston area who decided to put in eight million bucks with a 2x preference for 36% of the company. This meant, if you do the math, that the company, at least on paper, was worth 22 million bucks. No, that's great. Starting from nothing, going forward, looks pretty good. Angel investors worth that 100 grand has suddenly overnight, on paper at least, turned into almost 2 million bucks. That ain't bad. But it got more interesting because they needed more cash. They were growing and expanding and hiring. Got to about 100 employees need to raise more capital to go and expand to overseas markets. Found another VC, raised an additional $13 million on a valuation of $44 million. And that, that was a less risky one because they were really going great guns. And so they jumped in. And so the angel investor was sitting on almost now $4 million. A hundred grand turned into $4 million and it took about two and a half years. Oh my God, that's a great investment if you could only get it out. Well, the day finally came when you could get it out, which means you were able to sell the company. But because of the way the economy worked during that time frame, this was around 2002, 2003. And if you recall that time, we were all suffering from the great slide off of the peak of the, the bubble. And it was kind of bouncing up and down, but it was pretty terrible. And so things started getting a little flat and weird. And the company needed to get out. Everybody wanted to get out of it and do something different. 
so they found somebody to buy the company. And they found somebody to buy the company for $30 million. And the CEO of the company called the angel investor and said, I got good news and bad news. And the angel said, well, what's the good news? Well, the company's going to get sold for $30 million. Great. Because the angel investor thinks, I own $7 million bucks of that, or 7% of that. That's about $4 million. Bucks. That sounds awesome. Or two point. It's down a little bit. But two from the previous valuation. Two, two point one million bucks. Still awesome investment. Hundred grand, two million bucks, twenty X investment, awesome. What happens is that all ugly math. Because you take that thirty million dollars, you subtract off the original investment at one X, you subtract off the 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 uh, excuse me, the last investment at one X the original one at 2x, and just because we're all friends and neighbors and good time Charlies, we're going to give the management team that got us to this state of being able to get out of this monster just a million bucks for having been there done then. The management carve out happens. You do this math, and there's nothing left over to divide amongst the common shareholders. But investor B, doesn't care because they already got their money out. Investor A doesn't care because they got twice their money out. The management team doesn't care because they got a million bucks just handed to them. And every founder and the angel got zero dollars. And that was the bad news. And I was that angel. <laughs> I was the angel and got that phone call and I still hate that man. <laughs> I hired that man, and I hate him. Oh my God! But you, did you have any veto rights on the no. deal? No, no. You have a thing called drag along, which means you, if somebody agrees to do a thing, if you're in the minority, you just kind of, you just kind of whoosh right along with them. And I was drug along into the deal. So instead of a hundred turning into a twenty x multiple, a hundred turned into zero. Did the founders realize what was yeah. happening? Not until it happened. But not until it happened. But you, I mean, you must have been involved with. I mean, those numbers, the the Series A, Series B, it's not done in a vacuum. No, it's not. You can take that deal, or you can leave. Correct. It and but at the time when we took the deal, it was like, yeah, it was thumbs up. It was the right thing to do. Right. Kick ass VCs. Oh my God, pedigreed VCs. Right. Good stuff all around. And if I had had any kind of a brain about me, I would have done this math ahead of time. But I didn't do it. Yeah. And none of the founders did it either because it was their first time out. Yeah. No, I went through that. I did a startup and I was a founding member and by the C round, I went from owning a reasonable percentage of the company to owning virtually nothing. Uh -huh. But, it's, our, it's, but our, our back was against the wall, so you're two, yeah. one, two years into it, it's yeah. like we can either stop making payroll uh, or we'll take six right. million bucks. So what yeah. do you do? Yeah. You take it, they got a gun to your head, you can have the money at these terms or you guys can go away. I put, I put, the, hundred, I put the hundred grand in there to help them float payroll right. that one day. All right? That's what I did. And then that, that's what happened. Mark? If you could wind the story back, which way would you like? Put preferences. No, you don't have to physically do it. But, oh, but if you if you start there and uh -huh. you we go back in time and uh -huh. you put your hundred thousand dollars in, and you put preferences on it, what As would have been the likelihood of even getting to the first institutional investment, or what do you think would have happened when VCA showed up? Well, okay. So one of the things that also happened here, and I simplified it for the example, was there was some friends and family money in it too. I mean, there was like five grand from, from this relative and that relative. And the first thing the VC, the first round of VCs did, I didn't do it, but the first round of VCs did was they just said, you know what, whatever amount of dollars they put in, let's just pay them twice and make them go away. They call it cleaning the cap table. So that's what we did. 2X payday for, for grandma. Boom, grandma's out of it. I don't have to listen to grandma. I don't have to think about grandma. Grandma's gone. That, that happens all the time. But back to your point, if, let's suppose I've been sophisticated and brought in, you know, that or brought in the angel group I was in into the deal and then we would have that term, then we would have had preferred stock on that day and it would have been the, that would have been the A round. It would have been a ridiculously simple and stupid low A round. And we would have gone for more. I would have paid more. But you're making a good point, which is VCs are very sensitive to the current lay of the land in the deal. 
And they wanted, they do this math ahead of time too. And they try to figure out how am I going to get my money out? Is it going to be a big payday or a tiny payday? What's going to happen? The reason why we took the 30 grand, the 30 million dollar deal as the exit was that essentially not, not the original one, but, the, but the, the second one in didn't want to put any more in, didn't want to put any more investment in. And so they wanted essentially a tax wash for the fund at the moment, and so they just agreed to the deal. And so we all went along. This shutdown over taxes happens all the time. Two. It's probably worth pointing out that when a venture capitalist comes in, they may try to change some of the terms on a prior investor, particularly an angel as well. So uh -huh. even if you had yeah. put in some type of preference or something, yep. um, they may have seen fit to, uh, yeah. to dispense with that before they put their money in. Absolutely right. And usually, usually that comes in the form of a, of a payoff or a convertible note, which they will then conveniently pay pretty quickly after you sign the convertible note, and then you're gone too. It gets ugly is, I guess, the big point. When you take somebody's money, it can get ugly on you very fast, and if you don't do the math, and if you don't do this kind of math, you don't know really what you're walking into. It looks great on paper. And, and as founders, you know, again, you're back in that, that hardcore belief system that everything feels like it's working. Cash is coming into the company, we're making sales, company's growing, life is good. Somebody wants to buy the company, life is great, my ownership is this, I'm booking the McLaren, you know, all this kind of stuff is going on. And you could end up at zero so swiftly if you don't read the terms. So the moral of the story is, in fact, each time you take investment from anybody, it costs you control and money. Beware of what you're giving up on equity. That's the inequity of equity. That's what I wanted to say. So, I'll take questions on absolutely any topic whatsoever. <laughs> All right, go ahead. I'll come to you so, a second. So, what's the lesson there to avoid that? You do the math and you figure at the next round coming in, the way they're structuring it, you have to hit 30 or 40 at a minimum exit to make any money at all. And then you have to decide at that point whether it's in your company to get there. So I simplified the example also because I didn't include the goals of the VC. Or the, because when they make an investment, they also have goals that they are trying to achieve for their funds. Do you know, shall I spend a moment talking about the way a VC works? Okay, so a VC is a, is a person who manages a, a fund that they have raised from their limited partners. And what they want to do is they, they promise their limited partners that over a say 10 years time that the fund will return 3x, 4x, some multiple of their original investment. They also agree to operate in this sort of fashion. They agree to invest most of the money in the first four years and then just kind of sit tight on the investment for the last six and hopefully it will grow and they can take some funds back into the, they can return to their limited partners some amount of the cash that was invested. This means that a VC is going to make, over the course of the first four years of this activity, they're going to start allocating the money from their fund to investments in startups or, or opportunities. They don't tell you, and a sophisticated angel does this as well, a VC will make, say, if they make a million dollar investment in a company, they will keep two million dollars in reserve because they will also negotiate to pay to play into the next round of funding to maintain their percentage of ownership and to get some of that sweet preference that sits there, that participating business, that payback for the next round too. And so you pay to play. So you, you can imagine that over time you might make, say, a series of bets, say 10 of them, just for our purpose. And you want to make a 3x return on the whole of the fund. So let's suppose it's a $100 million fund. Now you've got a return. You promised somebody you can return $300 million to them. And you make a series of bets. You commit, in one way or another, 10 million, 10 million, 10 million, 10 million, 10 million. And you send those things out. Well, startups blow up all the time. They get killed by any number of good reasons. Market forces kill them. All sorts of things happen. Governments kill them. 
Look at what just happened with Bitcoin. Uh, with uh, I can't even pronounce it. Mount Gox. Gox. Gox, yeah. Just zeroed, right? Where did that money go? It leaked over time, I think, but it went. Um, so you make these bets, and you hope that they work. But you don't have an expectation that all of them are going to work. In fact, in your mind, you really think, OK, more than half of them will never return anything. I'll, I'll just get zero dollars back. If the company's going to be so horrible, it, it just won't work at all. A few of them might return exactly my investment back, like that thing I showed you, where just here's my, here's my payback. That's all I'm going to get back. Well, that doesn't do me any good for addressing my limited partners, and I've got to do a 3x return. So it means that a VC counts on a couple of powerful returns. Typically, they're shooting for a 10x or a 30x return out of one of these spots. Now that sounds like it's interesting from the VC's point of view looking at making 10 bets. But let's suppose you're on the other side of the table. Now I'm the, event, I'm the entrepreneur. And the VC is looking at me to do a return like that. Guess what? When you get to the point where somebody wants to buy your company and you have VCs involved, you're not a VC, are you? You're not a VC, are you? No. Okay, all right. <laughs> well, not now, right? <laughs> anyway, so what happens is, and this, this, believe, this, is, so in, this, is, this is something that's really tough to, to kind of get your head around. But unless the return on investment for the deal, for the execution and sale to them, actually generates a 5x or a 10x return, they actively block the sale. Even though everybody else might have made some money, they will actively block it because they don't want, they're betting on the big return, not on the tiny return. And they will take the tax write off instead and go bet again. It's a horrible situation. So you have to have the goals of the investor in mind as you walk through this thing from every, at every turn. It's tough. You had a question next. Uh, just a I, hope I, I don't know if I answered it or not. I kind of got along with it. I'm sorry. Well, it's complicated. It's, it, oh, God, it's so complicated. Just a, a comment is, is another option you have is just don't take the money. I think a lot of, a lot of founders, a lot of co-founders think that the success is getting the investment, right? And, yes. and there's stars in your eye, and there's these VCs, and they've yep. chosen you out of hundreds of other pitches. And, yep. and I think oftentimes, uh, maybe not the first round of money, but down the road, may not have necessarily needed that money. There was a lot of pressure being put on to grow it, so you make that 30x multiple uh -huh. or whatever. But when you start thinking about yourself and what's best for everybody in the team, you know, there's other pressures you, you have to pay attention to. My, one other quick note, just do, by doing this math, is for uh, co-founders, or actually not even co-founders, but for first, second, third rounds of employees, they get options. I you know I, I just did this math uh, for, for a friend of mine in a co-working space who's working for a startup. Um, startup's not around here, but he works up here. And it's a clean, clean tech startup. And he was given options. Mm -hmm. He's one of the first round employees, and all he's given is options, and a pitiful amount of that. All right. And he's doing a 25% discount on sure. what you would expect for a risk, salary. Risk reward, right? Yeah, 25% okay. discount for the salary. And so we took a look at his options. I'm like, well, let's take a look at what, what they're offering you for options. And we did the math. And if they did an, a 10x return on what their current valuation was, the amount of money he would make on his options would cover the discount in his salary for one year. And he'd already been working in three years. Yeah. So you, it's easy to forget about doing the math as, yeah. as, a, as a person who's been offered equity yes. in the company yeah. and forget that if I'm discounting my salary quite a bit to get in and I'm only getting a little bit of equity or a little bit of uh, options in return, yeah. there's rude awakening at some point in that path for a lot of different people. But absolutely right. I mean, uh, and, and, and let me say this about, about investors too, because I, again, I have been one. Uh, I've lost, lost money on this deal. I've made money on other deals. Um, I've put uh, more than a million bucks of my money at, at play in different deals uh, over the last little while. Um, the very best thing we did, uh, the very best exit I have had was that one to Mark Cuban. Because we started that company on our credit cards. We took no investment from anybody and we deliberately did it because of those reasons. And so my, my co-founder and I, we just, we just stuck to our guns. And if we had to go fly on an airplane, we, well, we paid that out of the receipts that we were getting from the sales. 
We grew the company organically. And so from, a, so, you know, we got to, you know, pretty substantial credit card debt, you know, $30,000 credit card debt. But the moment we had any cash that came in, we would just pay off the credit card debt. It was like, it was great. We weren't getting salaries, we were just blowing it that way. We did the negotiation with Mark Cuban and his partner, um, Todd Wagner at, at uh, Broadcast.com. Uh, we walked into the negotiation and said our company's worth $100 million based on our sales. He said it's worth 25. We agreed to disagree when he got to 35 and then we, we walked away from him. And he cussed us all the way out the door. Because he's a, he is a gentleman on TV, but he is not a gentleman. And then about a month later, it was a long plane ride back from Dallas, by the way, to Atlanta. If you, that's a really long ride. <laughs> to leave that kind of money on the table is bad. Remember, we had no investors. We didn't have to do this math. We, we owned it, flat out owned it. Then we got a phone call about a month later. It was like, you know, we're really kind of into you guys. Let's talk some more. And it got to be $45 million. And after a little more talking, it got to be $50 million, and we agreed on it. And so we signed a deal with them for $50 million bucks off a credit card start. That was great. When Yahoo, but we owned $50 million worth of restricted shares in Broadcast.com as a public company. Fortunately, that was when the bubble started going. Double fortunately, that's when, broad, that's when Yahoo bought Broadcast. And so the day they closed the deal with Broadcast, our restricted shares in Broadcast turned into unrestricted, wide open market shares in Yahoo, and then Yahoo took off. And so our sale to Cuban for 50 million bucks turned into $400 million worth of Yahoo stock. And that was awesome. <laughs> In fact, that was really, really awesome. That is a good, good day. And then the bubble burst. And because I was a director at Yahoo, and you can't just sell, just cause, you had to plan your sales. And my guy was calling me saying, you know, you really ought to sell this thing's going down. I went, well, we can talk about it, but, you know, it's just a temporary blip. It's going to go right back up. We're all good. I'm, I'm sitting out and we're hanging out with everybody. All of us telling each other this lie. And it cratered. And so it went from a share price of Yahoo of $250 a share to a share price of $9 a share. That's a humbling thing to look at your portfolio <laughs> when it goes from credit card debt to, oh my God, to crash. Anyway, it works. It can work. I guess I'm saying that you can actually do this and you can exit awesome. And, the, and it was so great to not have to answer to anybody at all. That was just the best. Didn't have to worry about anybody calling me. How's my money doing? When are you going to give it back to me? That's, that's, what, that's the code, right? They call and they say, or I will call and say, how are things going? How can I help you? And it's totally code every time for, how's my cash? When am I getting it back? Are you, are you, are you in the mood to sell your company yet so I can get it back? <laughs> that's the only time you get your money back. You get an exit. Yeah. It's, it stinks. You mentioned it before, but you might want to talk. I mean, the other thing is that there can be a real misalignment of interests among investors that can create um, some real exciting and unfortunate discussions in boardrooms and elsewhere. Uh huh. I don't know if you want to. Yeah. Uh, so the, one of the bad places is when the, when the, you know, Mark was sort of alluding to some of it. If you are an early investor and the later stage one comes in, then there's typically a misalignment um, because you're more, if you're early in, you're more tolerant of the risk, so you're there more to help them go be awesome somehow and sell and be notorious. And the later ones are like, I want my money, I want it now, I want it big, let's exit, let's make the return. And that is, that is a huge, yeah, the boardroom is ugly. The boardroom actually is dramatic and ugly. And I don't know if you've ever been inside one, but it, it's, not, it's not usually the place where happy things happen. Other questions? Again, any topic at all, I'm wide open. Okay, so uh, somewhat turned the corner to a different topic. I mean, you had the light side and the dark side, and maybe this is in the gray area here. I think it might relate to when you're talking about bringing in equipment and stuff. So I'm going to talk about the private university. Oh, sure. Okay. Yes. And so if you're not doing fee for service, then that's, that's straightforward. But if you're you now have access to infrastructure, a million dollar piece of equipment, that sure. you have, and the university wants a, a piece of that action. Yeah. And yet they obviously almost have zero risk. 
So, so uh -huh. what should the two parties expect of one another? Well, so, okay, which side would you like me to speak to? I'm not, I'm not going to look in my mirror and see what Mark's face is doing right now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, Mark, Mark told me it was, you know, it was unrestricted, so I'll just say it. And I, look, I, I run it at Georgia Tech too, so uh, I run into this. It's often the posture of a university to think that, man, the idea is worth all this stuff. It's just worth some equity piece of the puzzle. And I know there are places like, um, I don't know how you do it here. You can, you can shout it out. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Well, so for example, uh, somewhere nearer to you than to me is a uh, pin and they take either 49% or 51% of the ownership of the company right at day one. And they have no risk. They have no risk at play. They'll, in fact, not only that, they have an ability to snatch back their IP, as you do, as we do at Georgia Tech, in case the startup fails anyway. Nothing is really at risk, per se. So the question then becomes, well, what's a fair equity arrangement if you want to enter into it with a university? My, my belief is it ought to be zero. Georgia Tech's stance is it ought to be about three or five percent. What is it, Mark? Now everyone's turning away. So, so uh, we tried to put in, because the university hadn't really done a lot of this, we put in standard terms of it's, it's five percent not, and before, let me finish the sentence before you jump on me. <laughs> non dilutive through a million five in revenue, financing, or otherwise. And that's only to make sure that somebody doesn't grant 30 shares and then immediately do the A round and, and take us to zero. It's yeah. a, it's a uh, moral regulator that doesn't necessarily get in the way. I vetted it with a bunch of VCs who said that's the anti dilution is so small it doesn't really much matter. Right. So, does everybody know what Mark means by anti-dilution? So the idea is that you can negotiate. Again, everything's negotiation. When you're, when you're doing the investment thing, everything's negotiation. So as part of the preferred round of stock, you can say, I want to have my shares, not my percentage of ownership, not be diluted by any further round until the company hits some particular milestone of, of value. Usually it's like 2x or 3x the the valuation that you currently are standing at when you put the money in. That sort of thing. So you want just kind of or up to a million bucks or some pick some you know roundish sounding number and then go for it. And so they and, and they get away with it because frankly the you're in a you're negotiating from a position of weakness. If you were negotiating from a position of strength, you would never allow it. Because depending on the term, and you're that's that's reasonable, I think. But depending on the term, that anti-delusion could extend up to a pretty large value, $5 million, something else. And you don't want that, and the subsequent round of investors certainly don't want to see that term in play because they want their own term in play. And we only take common stock, we don't ask for preferred, and we only take observation rights on board, we don't ask Also good, so no voting rights? No voting okay. rights. Okay. Expressly, expressly do not want voting rights. Uh-huh. For legal reasons. Yeah. Yeah. Same at tech. So this question is, if I came to you with your investor hat on and you see a deal like that with the university and those are the terms that they're throwing out, what, which, what's your gut reaction? Um, are you asking me how I invest? Uh, just, I'm glad you, you say that too. I mean, I've already done this with a couple of other people. All right. I'm just looking to connect a few more. I would people. look at the team first. Yeah. Not the opportunity. I look at the team. Oh, no, but I'm saying in terms of if, if you're, if you're doing your due diligence, you like the team, you like most of what you've seen, and you come to... That term. All right, that I'm, at, I'm at the end of the road, and I'm at that point, right? All right. I'm not so bad with that, actually. A million bucks, I ha I'll have a belief that we can get the company worth more than that, so we'll like blow that cap away, and life will be fine. And everybody else will get squished down, university included. No worries. That, 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 that's, why it's, that's the only reason it's reasonable. If he said five million bucks, no. I'd run away. I'd, I'd run away screaming and tell everybody along the way. No. So, you, there's got to be other questions. I, I'm not doing my job if I'm not like provoking you, so I'll have to say some other provocative things. Go. <laughs> All right, you, you and then you. All right, so when, in the condition we were talking about where somebody reversed mess, okay? And then, oh, yeah. And then there's, um, there was an offer for the company. Uh huh. Do those shares automatically invest to that founder or? Can the other partners still buy them out? Depends right on the contract. The sale. It depends on the contract. Okay. It could. 
I have seen it where if it's not vested, it's just gone. Just gone. It's in the, it's in the option pool. It's just kind of gone. Gone away. Uh, I've seen other ones where you have an agreement about what, what non-vested shares are actually bought for. You like pre-buy them. And then that happens quickly. But they're usually at some stupendous discount from what the actual value of the company would be at that point, or the shares would be at that point. Like the par value of a share, whatever, like your point oh oh one dollars, that sort of thing. Yeah, pretty ugly. The book value. Uh, you wanted to go, and, and then, then you're next. Um, I just wondered, based on your talk, if you should be using other metrics at Venture Lab than companies started, if you should have founders gotten out whole. <laughs> oh, oh. So I didn't talk about the other parts of Venture Lab because I, you know, I'll be honest with you, I don't count um, investment necessarily. I mean, we, we all report on it because Autumn says it's a good thing to do, so we all like jabber about that sort of thing. And so for Venture Lab, the stats for us are in the last five years, the companies we've created raised $433 million in funding. And that's pretty good. And, and that's over maybe 60 companies in the last five years. So that, that's pretty good average raise for all those companies. That it's unevenly distributed like the future is, unevenly distributed. And but but my, the way my, my metrics are like this. I just want Georgia Tech stuff out in the world. I want, I want this to go out in the world, and I don't have any ability at the outset to determine whether an idea is a good one or a horrible one. I have no clue. I just want it out in the world and going. And so at Venture Lab, we have an open door policy. We'll take anybody, anything, anytime, and we don't take any percentage of ownership or anything in my group at all. We take it all in. We'll build it if it can be built. We'll advise through all this drama all the way up to the sea round sometimes and just get it out in the world because I just want all this great stuff that we do on our campus to go forward. And I'd like for our students who probably won't have the academic gig they think they're going to have uh, when they get through their PhDs, I want them to be able to go and make a job and be an employer also. That's just being able to make your own job is so powerful, such a cool thing. So that's what we focus on. So my, the metrics I actually use, I do the autumn reporting, which is how many inventions do you do? look at? Uh, 250 odd inventions. How many uh, companies did you start? 20, but that's not really true. That's how many legal entities we formed. We have a hundred active startups that are kind of on the way, either to cratering or to going somewhere. I'm, I'm more worried about I'm more worried about how we do what we do than I am about somebody's, you know, spreadsheet someplace. So I'm I'm sorry if I misled you earlier. No, I really don't I really don't care about that because here's the other thing, you know, there's so much emphasis placed on scalable startups, and the only person that a scalable startup truly matters to is actually the investor, not the, not the founder. We have, we have great startups at tech where it's a, a mom and pop operation, although this is kind of an exotic mom and pop. They're, they're, they're making uh, Femto second uh, lasers um, in their garage. That's kind of exotic. That's not a usual mom and pop, okay? It's not like a dry cleaners. I guess it's a Georgia Tech dry cleaners. It's a Femto second lasers in, dry, in, a, in a garage. And they sell a million dollars worth of them a year. And it's just the two of them. And they, and they employ you know, students to help them build these things. It's great. It's just great. And they've been doing it for 10 years. It's just amazing. <coughs> Let them keep on doing it. We have another group. And again, it's a husband and wife team. And it's a, meteor, it's a meteorological, I can never say that word, a company. And they figured out how to forecast hurricanes based on the, I guess, the waves of dust coming off of the Sahara. And, and they're not scalable at all. They have exactly one customer, and that customer is Shell. And they sell this information, this prediction information to Shell because Shell wants to know when to evacuate the platforms in the Gulf, and they want to arbitrage oil prices based on the activity coming into the Gulf. So Shell gives them half a million bucks a year just to gin up a few charts once, twice a week. It's awesome. <laughs> and, and I would never invest in it because they're never going to sell it. I would never get any money back out of it. I might get some dividend back. But for them, if, it, if you're them and you get a half million dollars a year extra every year, 
you're, you're taking the fancy trips. You're all over. It's great. It's a good day. So we're not, well, I'm not focused on scalable startups. I, don't, I wouldn't know one if, if they walked in the door today. If you had one, you described it to me. I, I could not guess. I've given up. But what you just described is, a, is a, an option uh, that we're pursuing right now, and that is partnering with an operator industrial company. And, and in that way, you can structure your return as rather an annuity. Yes. You know they're never going to sell it. That's right. You can, you can do a way, dividend structure, exactly. and, that, and then you can get some money back. Yes. And as they grow, as they grow slowly, then you're kind of in that same sort of good day mode. Right. But if you're but if you're investing in more than just that one deal, then you're probably looking to use those funds to provide the risk capital for some other activity. So, um, you had a question. Then I guess we'll uh, then I can just like go, I can just sit here and blather it in private. Just uh, really quickly, um, uh, as opposed to ownership in terms of um, uh, getting your money back, um, uh, can you speak a little bit to ownership uh, in uh, terms of control? Once you have that first investor in there, yeah. um, uh, a lot of um, founders are, are at a loss because they're no longer in control of the destiny of their company. It's almost like the golden rule. Yeah, and, and so I, I guess I, was, I said, I, I showed in the chart and did it deliberately that you know, if you can get away with that first round or any round and you only sell a third of whatever you have at, at offer out, then you, you kind of won the investment battle because they try to battle you to like 40% or 45%, or they add conditions that say if you don't meet some milestone, why well, then we get an option to buy a little more for this, you know, we get a little more for it because it's still risky. You didn't make it. So it's riskier, so therefore it ought to be worth more. And so, but, but I, I want to I say this over and over, and that is the moment you take a check from any soul, it doesn't matter who and it doesn't matter how much, you're working for them. And you need to know what their goal is in giving you that. If your goal is, you know, your, your aunt and she just wants you to be good and do well, that's one thing. If you took money from me, then I would be looking, I would be looking to get paid back. And I would have in my mind, okay, I want two or three X of what I gave you and I want that in about a year and a half or two. And I'd be pushing you to sell the company to give me that return. Okay. So we're standing in the way. Between I'm between you and beer, and I hate to be between anybody and beer. So, oh, so. so thank you. All right.